Hello, my name is Dr. Connor Whaley and welcome to Peopling the Pass. And in this video, I'm going to be talking about soldiers and civilians in Rome's southeast. So what topic am I talking about today? Well, I'm talking about soldiers and civilians in Rome's southeast. There are many varied relationships between soldiers and civilians in the region between the years about 100 and 600 CE. Many of these have to do with family life. But from about 300 CE or so on, there was an increase in the number of soldiers there and an increase in the number of fortifications as well, such as Umar Rasas, which is depicted in this slide. As far as where it is that I'm talking about, well, most of the project is centered on what is today Jordan and parts of Israel, Palestine, which you can see in this map. So Jordan is the light colored part of this map. Most of the Roman or pseudo-Roman settlements are on the western half of the country along the border with Israel-Palestine. Some of them stretch all the way down towards Saudi Arabia and others spread sporadically off to the east and towards Syria and Iraq. The parts of Israel-Palestine I'm concerned with are sort of along the south coast of the Dead Sea, but also the Negev, which stretches towards Egypt. In late antiquity, you get a sense of the Rome's eastern frontier here with the bottom half representing the area that I'm talking about, what says uh, Arabian Palestine the third. Now there are a huge number of forts of various sizes. There's small fortlets, there's towers, there's larger forts with legions and so on to towns and cities. And the landscape itself in the region is much more varied than perhaps uh, many people realize. So there are quite lush landscapes and cities depending on what time of year it is. So these images are from February when it's quite so cool and some suitable rainfall. So in the city of Jerash, for instance, or Garassa, here's a shot of the Oval Plaza and Temple of Zeus. And the city was found in between, you said to be seven hills, a bit like Rome, to the view at Pella, sort of a bit south and west of Jerash part of the same sort of urbanized area, looking down towards the Dead Sea to Gadara, further north of Jerash and also Amman, the capital, heading towards the border, different part of the border with Israel and also parts of Syria. Now from those lush landscapes, we go to the, the desert of the steppe where there are all sorts of fortifications often running in a line along Roman roads. So for instance, here we have on the left, a tower. And from around that tower, you can look to the south and I believe a bit to the west and see that small fort um, on the top of that plateau. There are a huge diversity of these such as Udra, which is not far from Petra, famous Petra down towards the south. There's El Ejun, which is the best excavated probably of forts in the region. And there is Um al Jamal, not far from the border with Syria in modern day Jordan. As far as who I'm talking about, it's the soldiers and civilians. Amongst the civilians, my primary interest is in family members, so wives, children, parents, etc. Though I'm also interested in traders who are engaged in economic activities with the Roman soldiers, uh, pilgrims in late antiquity when the whole region and the empire becomes Christianized, pilgrimage becomes a big industry and may then pass through forts and fortifications, and then everybody else. So although I'm focusing on families, I really am interested in the full range of interactions. As far as the soldiers in the first half of this project from 100 to about 300, many of them are in traditional legionaries auxiliaries who were based in the region when what had been the Nabataean kingdom was annexed by Rome. In late antiquity, the second half, many of these are frontier soldiers, usually called Limitani, who appear in law codes and inscriptions, and they tend to be more regional in terms of their origin. So from the towns, forts, and cities uh, in which we find them, less likely to come from further afield. As far as what they were doing, well, a lot of the soldiers were doing the kinds of things we expect soldiers to do. So watching out for bandits and raids in the area, such as these two authors from the fourth century indicate, Ammianus and Eusebius. We talk about forts being placed to watch out for raids. But also they were doing a whole bunch of other things. And this is sometimes led to 
comments about the soldiers being part-time. So they witness official documents, they engage in construction projects, and as I said, they are involved in the pilgrimage industry amongst many other things. Now, as far as what sources or data do I look at? Well, there's a wide variety of sources that you have to use in order to understand the soldiers and civilians in the region. We don't have the same long narrative histories that we use for other subjects. So there are the physical remains, the places where the soldiers live, like the forts, like here we have two shots from L.A. Jeune in Jordan. There are towns as well, so it's not just these forts a bit removed from civilian settlements. There's also towns like Umm al-Jamal in which the soldiers were based specifically within the walls of the city. We also use small finds uncovered during excavations and at El Ejun, which as I said, was one of the best excavated spots in the region. They found things like cooking utensils, jewelry, beads, hairpins, spearheads, and all sorts of little military things. But they've also found items pertaining to food and drink besides cooking utensils. So the remains of plants like wheat and barley to the remains of animals who were probably consumed like sheep and goats, especially, but also chickens cattle, pigs, and even some wilder animals too. All this evidence points to interactions between soldiers in the narrow region, but also a bit further afield. So some of the things that they consumed had to come from further away. Inscriptions also play a big part in understanding the relationship between soldiers and civilians. So there are all sorts of small inscriptions, but there are also bigger dedicatory imperial inscriptions, such as we find at Kasser Bashir, the fort on the left, and Kasser al Halabat, the fort on the right. So Kasser Bashir, and you can see the inside of the fort uh, with the doorway uh, on the front of it, there is this dedicatory inscription. There you're going to see the Latin version, the English translation, which just announces the completion of the fort. And that dates to about 300 CE. We also have this massive inscription, which dates to sometime around 500 CE, so some 200 years later than the previous one. And it's a, an edict of the Emperor Anastasius, and it includes all sorts of different interesting things like the kinds of soldiers that we find in the region, the financing involved in paying them taxes and pay, reports on their duties, and even instances where they get extorted by officials. Uh, the inscription itself has a complicated history because it was found in pieces and they've slowly been putting it back together and trying to document where it was originally. Now there are also papyri, although Egypt is usually the place associated with papyri, and obviously most of the papyri we have from the ancient Mediterranean world come from Egypt, but some have been found in Jordan and Israel, Palestine. So we give you two sets of examples. One, we have the Babatha archive found around the southern part of the Dead Sea, dates to around 100, 140 CE. And this is a collection of documents that belonged to one woman named Babatha. The documents themselves are in a range of languages, Greek, Nabataean, Aramaic, and Hebrew, and they illustrate many aspects of her day-to-day -day life, especially regarding trade and property rights, and even her rights and privileges within the wider community, and at a time when the Nabataean kingdom was being annexed by Rome. At the end of antiquity, we have some papyri from Petra. Uh, a small cache of them were found in this church, North Church, in the center of the city, and these are deal with events in about 50, 60 years in the middle of the sixth century. Not many of them deal specifically with soldiers, but sometimes we get hints that soldiers were in and involved in day-to-day -day activities, such as this Flavius Dusarius, who is a former prefect of a local fort. We also have graffiti, many, 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 many thousands of graffiti found in the eastern desert of Jordan in the Haran with all these basalt rocks from a former volcano. Some of these just have illustrations of animals, some of them just have the names of individuals, individuals, but some of them provide a bit of insight into interactions between soldiers and civilians, such as this one in which the individual claims he migrated into the inner desert with the military unit and was on the lookout for his cousin. Finally, we have the law codes. So there are a wide range of law codes from late antiquity from the reign of Theodosius II in the fifth century, as well as Justinian in the sixth century. And many of these have to deal with soldier and civilian interactions. Often in an ideal sense, this is what soldiers should do vis-a-vis -vis civilians in the day-to-day, -day, as well as what civilians should do 
vis-a-vis -vis soldiers in the day-to-day, -day. but sometimes they provide some insight into the lived experience as well. So there are a number of laws that talk about marriage between soldiers and civilians, and some of the later ones from the age of Justinian highlight some changes between involving what women were allowed to do if their husbands disappeared. So in this one example here, uh, it says that we command that for however many years they remain on active service, their wives are to wait, even if they have received no letter or reply from their husbands. And if any such wife hears that her husband is dead, we do not let her enter into a second marriage, even then, unless the wife puts in an appearance and so on. So although it deals with the ideal situation, it does also give us some sense of the experiences of the individuals. Now, as far as how can this topic or material tell us about real people in the past? Well, I'm going to focus on one specific example or set of examples, and namely the papyri found in Nisana in Israel, and there's a picture of it there. There have been a number of excavations carried out, but they've also found uh, a few hundred papyri, most of those in Greek, some of them in Arabic, some of them are literary papyri with poems and so on. A lot of them uh, include official documents. They mostly date to the 6th century CE and the 7th century CE. To give you a sample of the papyri that we have from Nisana, there are, for instance, divisions of property, such as one dated to 512, marriage documents, such as one dated to 537, and another dated to 558, and then a settlement of a lawsuit, and even more administrative things like the levy of camels and camel riders. To give you two specific examples, one of the marriage certificate or the marriage settlement, uh, it reads, and there's a picture of it there, the following have entered into an agreement with each other, Flavius Alubai, son of Elias, resident of Nasana village, that he has given his younger daughter, Ania, a minor, the common bond of matrimony to Flavius Valens, son of Alubai, Alhub, son of Alubai, and Valens, his brother, both resident in Nasana village. The name Flavius is usually associated with imperial officials, but also soldiers. So we think the Flavii in this document are all soldiers or were soldiers. They give another example, this levy of camels and camel riders. It's basically a list of camels needed for something as well as camel riders needed for something. And a document like this provides the name of individuals who were based there and involved in various activities, many of them military, but we don't always know. So there is Saad, son of Abraham, for instance. There's Aziz, son of Stephan, all the way down to the... Um, Menas, son of Lucian, and more. Because of all the papyri, scholars have been able to provide a list of all the individuals that appear. And looking at this list, we get a sense of who lived there and how they interacted with each other, in part because of who features in which documents. So this is just a small sample of the individuals we know of from Nisana from the sixth century when soldiers were there. So on the left, we have a bunch of civilians. For instance, a neighbor of a soldier, we have a grandfather of a soldier, we have a wife-to-be of a soldier, as well as a sister of a soldier, and then we have the soldiers themselves. And this is just a small sample of three lower-ranking soldiers, Flavius, son of Khalafallah, Flavius Ham, and Sergius, and then an officer, a different Sergius, noted at the bottom. Now, these soldiers are not Romans like we think of from earlier periods in Roman history who have moved from Italy. These are all people who are probably from the local environment, you know, grew up in and around Nisana and spent much of their life there and interacted with the community in that way. And that brings me to the end of the video. If you want to learn more, please go to the People in the Past website where you'll find some further reading and more. And thank you for watching.